this is the second occasion in just about a month that I've had the pleasure of sharing this platform with Sandra Cooper, who is my good friend. Sandra is someone who is passionate about her spiritual growth. She's creative and really authentically dedicated to living truth as we teach here. She's also, as a trainer, facilitator, and life coach, committed to the personal transformation of others. And so this morning, she is bringing together that creativity, her passion for truth, and her, her um, skills as a facilitator to touch, move, inspire you beyond where you are to a wonderful, that wonderful life that we are all called to live. And so this morning, Miss Sandra. Good morning. This is the new me. God expressing through this voice this morning. It is truly a glorious day here at the Temple of Light. And I acknowledge the Christ presence in each and every one of you. Let's say together, this is a beautiful day and I gratefully rejoice in it. I am not convinced. Let's do it again. This is a beautiful day and I gratefully rejoice in it. I say a very special welcome to all of those who are, well, we don't have any first time visitors, but everyone here today is here for the first time. You have never been here on a Sunday on the 20, 24th of March um, 2019 yet, have you? No. So you're here for the first time. Yes, so it was a choice that you made to be here. And I'm deeply grateful to have you. I'm also welcoming the, those persons who are, who are joining us on the World Wide Web. That's also a choice. Um, I say a special thanks to Carol who anchored the morning and she certainly is an anchor in my own life. Now, as a very small child, I was terrified of thunder. You know, especially the explosive kind of thunder. And that had me scampering under the bed. The adults wisely informed me that when little girls behave badly, God would get angry and send thunder as a warning of more severe punishment to come. My impressionable little girl's mind at that time took it all in. And I believe that I had made God angry. I had caused the thunder. Now, my blessed grandmother would try to assure me, after the fact, of course, and she would say, okay, the only way I could spare punishment was to go on my knees and pray to gentle Jesus. Of course, again, figuring it out in my child's mind, since Jesus was God's only son, it would only be a matter of time before gentle Jesus would start sending thunder after me, just like his father. And so I grew up with some really negative images of God, you know, the God up there in the sky, which led me to feel a whole lot of fear and guilt and shame around who I was and what I thought of and what I did. Of course, I went to church and I went to Sunday school like a good little Catholic, not because I wanted to, but because I was afraid of what would happen if I didn't go. It was not surprising, therefore, that as soon as I got old enough to stop getting beaten, I stopped going to church altogether. So we fast forward now to 1983, when I was invited here by Howard Daly of blessed memory. And the rest, you can say, is history. Here. The fear of God dissolved 
and I became like a dry sponge in water. The experience was transformational, and I have never looked back. I, felt, I fell deeply in love, in love with the all-embracing presence of God, fascinated with a deeper understanding of Jesus and his teachings, and committed to living the principles of the science of mind. And so, in sharing a little bit of my journey with you, I've entitled my message this morning, God, Jesus, and Me. So let's begin with God, as we always do. I'll start with a disclaimer. Any attempt on my part to define God will naturally be limited. How can one give a finite definition to that which is infinite? What I do know is that God is creator of this universe and the substance, the life, and the intelligence of it. We were made in the image and likeness of this intelligence, and so it expresses as you and me, and we can never, ever be separated from it. God is a creative presence within us that is always pushing and prodding us to stretch, to forgive, to love, to evolve, and to prosper. God is nature unfolding in all its glory, in every living thing imaginable, in the beauty of the golden puy blossoms, the tiny hummingbird building her nest. It's almost time for her to come back, eh? <laughs> as well as the fury of the storm. I experience God in the harmonies of a beautiful song, in the lightest air movement of a dancer, in a soft, cool breeze, in the majesty of our mountains. And I watch HGTV and I see people um, wanting to have a mountain view. And all I have to do is look through my window. For me, we have mountains all around us. Aren't we blessed? I see God in the rising and the setting of the sun. And yes, I now see God in the crash of the thunder. I experienced God in the intricate plot of a movie because it took the creativity of a writer to get that plot together. I see God in the songwriting of a Bob Marley and yes, a Buju Bantan. And in the swiftness of a Usain Bolt. And now creativity, he has this new, um, what do you call it now, like a, a scooter that he's marketing. So we don't stop the creativity that God has presented to us, and it can manifest in any way. Who would have thunk that Usain would be putting out a, a scooter? God is in the message I am speaking, and it is in the consciousness with which you are hearing it and discerning what I'm saying. Neil Donald Walsh, in his book, Conversations with God, put it like this, and I quote, all these devices are mine. All these avenues are open to me. I will speak to you if you will listen. I will come to you if you will invite me. I will show you then that I've always been there. Always. End of quote. That was God talking. Now this very personal and intimate understanding of God is a far cry from the God of my past. And definitely not an old white man in the sky with a long white beard. How many of you th thought of God that way in the past? You're afraid to put up your hand? Yes, the old white man with the beard up there. And, and even now, we, I've heard people talk about the man upstairs and we point up. And like even some of us, even myself, I would say, you know, God knows. I heard a version of that to say, well, we're looking really at the all-encompassing God, which is in here, out there, it is all around. So I don't feel too badly if I point up anymore, because I'm not referring to a heaven in the sky. In this moment, I know that God is the very life force that pulses through me. 
And it is that now which is healing my body from this condition that is now stopping all the coughing so that I don't cough while I'm standing here. And it's that God which beats my heart and guides my steps and allows each one of us to connect through its all-embracing, all-sustaining love. I'm very clear about God in my life. Are you? Right? Without question. I mean, I just have to listen to the birds. I know that that is God. Look at the beautiful Bogan Villa. I know that that is God. And the artistry of Fay. That is God. So, where does Jesus fit into all this? Many years ago, on a trip overseas, I ran into an old temple member. I hadn't seen her for some time, and so I asked how she was and how come I hadn't seen her at church. My dear, she responded, I miss Jesus. You people don't worship Jesus. And she was right. We don't worship Jesus. Instead, we acknowledge him as a greatest way shower of all time, as one who realized his unity with God and became the channel for the expression of powers no one before had ever dreamed of. Unity minister Dr. Eric Butterworth puts it this way. Before Jesus, man had existed in the consciousness of separation from God. He would pray to God, he could talk to God, and receive help and guidance from him. But God was always up there, out there, and man was down here. Jesus knew himself to be an expression of God, or the activity of God life and intelligence pressing itself into visibility. Butterworth continues, Jesus discovered his own divinity, his unique relationship with the infinite. He discovered that through faith, he could open doors into the inexhaustible mind of God, and that what was true of God must be potentially true of all humankind. Jesus then discovered the Christ consciousness within himself. You can call him the Christopher Columbus of the soul. He crossed the frontier of his mind and discovered a new world within himself. You like that? Nice image. Jesus helped show us that there is a power in the universe greater than we are and greater than any condition we are facing or any affliction we are experiencing. He pointed to this power and modeled its accessibility by going to it constantly himself. For example, when he um, was tempted or just before his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Jesus of my understanding taught love, forgiveness, and spiritual principles conveyed through his many parables. He came to teach the world practical, effective living so that when we engaged in his depth of love, we would experience the light of understanding, acceptance, and non-judgment, which changes the way we see things and ultimately changes the things we see. Jesus knew the power of thought. He knew how to manipulate energy and matter, how to rearrange it, how to redistribute it, how to utterly control it. Scripture records his many miracles, multiple healings, casting out devils, turning water into wine, and feeding 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. Somebody sent me a cartoon. If Jesus had fed the 5,000 in 2019, so here is Jesus standing with a loaf of bread in one hand and a fish in the other hand, and there's a multitude in front of him. And there are comments from the audience. Is that bread gluten-free? <laughs> have you tested that fish from mercury? I, I, I can't have any of that. I'm vegan. <laughs> and we would have had a number of probable other criticisms. What's that? Indeed. I have come
come to know Jesus as human and approachable and enlightened, as a master teacher and guide, and as my benchmark for whether I am really walking the spiritual talk or not. When Jesus said, come follow me, in Matthew 4.19, he was not asking us to fall in blind worship of him. And this is what many of us um, have done. In making him the object of our worship, he ceases to be the way shower for our, our own self-realization and spiritual unfoldment. I believe that he meant for us to follow his example, to acknowledge our own divinity, and to allow our Christ consciousness to be revealed. And so it's down to me. Remember, us, it's God, Jesus, and me. So we now have a little more clarity, I, ex I imagine, around God as source, creative intelligence, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. Jesus as human being who fully understood, embraced, and expressed his Christ consciousness. So what about me? Where do I fit into the scheme of things? Or you, for that matter? I believe that the connecting element between God and Jesus and me is the mind and the use we make of it. Remember that we are living in an intelligent universe that responds to our mental states. To the extent that we learn to control these mental states, we shall automatically control our environment. Whenever I reflect on times in my life when things weren't quite working the way I planned. I could trace the cause back to some stinking thinking. <laughs> Where I planted and nurtured seeds of doubt, fear, lack, and limitation. Can you relate to that? When we have a really strong sense of awareness. You know, I've, I've learned to be very gentle with myself and to just allow my self-awareness to support me because I'm very aware when I screw up. I'm very aware when my thoughts go awry. I'm very aware when I say something or I do something that is out of alignment with the higher vision for myself. And I know, because I now have the tools to address it. I make a new choice. I forgive myself and I move on. And so, just like how the farmer can pull out the weeds and plow up back his field and plant a new crop, we now can make some new cho choices regarding the thoughts that we plant and nurture. You know, change your thinking, change your life is our mantra. And it sums up our philosophy in a nutshell. Everything, and I mean everything, begins and ends in mind. It's really amazing how many verses of scripture talk about the importance of the mind. I came, about, came across about 11 of them, and I've picked five. Romans 12, 2, who knows which one that is? You remember? Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Proverbs 23, 7. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. This one is a little longer. Philippians 4.8 Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Philippians again, 2.5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And the last one, 2 Corinthians 10.5. Take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Who we are then 
is shaped moment by moment by the thoughts we choose to let into our mind and heart. Research studies suggest that we talk to ourselves 50,000 times a day. Some people would call that madness. And on an average, 80% of that self-talk is negative. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I've heard myself saying, I'm a sole entrepreneur. I cannot qualify for that um, proposal. I can't write that proposal. I can't. I can't. Can you relate to that? Mm. People don't like me. You know, I'm far more comfortable speaking to a group of people than picking up the phone and calling one business person. Because listen to my stinking thinking. Let's say it's Christine. Christine is busy. Maybe Michael called her already. Um, oh, it's almost lunchtime. I'll call her after lunch. Oh, it's the end of the day and she must be going out to a meeting. And I go on and on and the day ends and I don't call Christine. So I'm really present to that. So how do we take these thoughts captive? How do we renew our minds? How do we, how do we change our mindset? How do we focus on those things that are good and right and pure and just? It is about conscious awareness. Making new choices, regular doses of self-love and forgiveness, and constant, consistent prayer. The significance of that is this. Our life is a continuous upward spiral of growth and unfoldment. We must grow. We can't help it. This growth involves every function of the mind until we literally have the mind of the Christ. Now, the science of mind, this teaching, has certainly kept me grounded and has provided the tools that have helped me to deal with the issues of daily living. For example, I've learned that there is one and only one presence and power expressing through our life. We are one with it, and I've learned to trust it completely. I've learned spiritual mind healing treatment or affirmative prayer, which enables me to heal ways of thinking that are rooted in fear and limitation. I learned that no matter what is swirling around me on the outside, God is equally evenly present in all people and in all circumstances. And that there is really nothing to fear, only God to know. I learned about the nature of forgiveness and how it enables us to release old hurts and resentments against others. I learned to be patient with myself and respectful of others, knowing that we are all learning and growing together. I learned to let people be as they are going, doing the best they know how at their level of consciousness. I learned to see the wholeness and perfection in others as they are themselves expressions of God. And so when my mother used to bring this strap when I didn't want to go to Sunday school, looking back, she was doing the best she knew how as a mother. I learned to set and pursue goals that are intended for only the highest good and which hurt or manipulate no one. I learned about the power of choice that all choice has consequences, and that I can choose to change my thoughts, words, and actions to match my grandest vision for myself. And I've learned how to ask and to seek and to listen for God's inevitable response. On that note, I used to wonder how I know that the response I was getting was a response from God and not data from other sources. Have you ever wondered that? When you, when you get a little joke to say, do something, call somebody, or, or so. It, have you ever asked, is this God or is this just? So. <clears throat> now, Neil Donald Walsh, in his conversations with God, he offers this perspective. Mine, and I quote, mine is always your highest thoughts your clearest word, your grandest feeling. Anything less is from another source. 
The highest thought is always that thought that contains joy. The clearest words are those words that contain truth. The grandest feeling is that feeling which you call love. This love is unconditional. It is the patient, kind, compassionate, forbearing, forgiving, honorable, righteous, unselfish love explained in 1 Corinthians 13. These words describe the attributes of God, attributes that we also embody and which are deep, authentic, unwounded, unprogrammed, and without judgment. Now, if you look at page 10 in your program, there are some affirmations. So I have them there for you, and you can take the program home. And so I want us to say them together. <clears throat> the first one, I know who I am a beautiful, unique, and beloved expression of God. I have the wisdom of God today. I think the right thoughts, say the right words, and make the right decisions in every situation I face. It is the Father's good pleasure to provide for me. I name my good and claim my good. And I trust and depend on the power and the presence of the eternal I am, my Christ consciousness. And so it is. So for the week coming, I invite you to select one of these affirmations, just one, and make it your mantra. Saying it when you awaken in the morning, several times throughout the day and when, just before you go to bed at night, before you fall asleep. Say it with feeling and passion until it becomes a part of you. And then watch what happens. And I invite you to report to me. <laughs> just choose one and make it your mantra. So friends, the little girl who used to scamper under the bed to hide from the thunder is now a big girl with a little more wisdom and a lot more confidence. She's no longer as afraid. She has in evolved into a deeply spiritual person, a seeker of truth and always aiming at being a better version of herself. Second Timothy 1.7 says it all. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. I have found great peace in this study of truth and the way it has allowed me to use my mind. And also to have this certainty that there is that within me that guides my growth and perfect unfoldment. I know it for me, and I know it for each and every one of you. Namaste.